All right. Well, I think we should be online now. And uh, welcome to the another MathJax Hangout on Air. Uh, this time, I have uh, we have with us um, five specialists, no, six specialists on textbooks, in particular open and math-oriented textbooks. Um, and um, before uh, we get started, I think a round of introductions would be in order. So I'll just go from the left to the right and start with David Farmer. I'm David Farmer. I work at the American Institute of Mathematics. Um, I have lots of interest in terms of open textbooks. A particular one is I've been working on a tool to produce HTML versions of math papers and math textbooks, where ideally it just takes the latex source as the author wrote it with no changes and gives you something better than just posting a PDF online. And there are two particular ways where I want it to be better. Uh, a PDF document, it's very hard to scan the whole thing and get a sense of what's going on. And when you're in the middle of reading something, if it says by equation 3.2, when you click on that, then you're jumping all over the document uh, trying to remember what that equation was. And so I want to specifically address those two problems. And ideally, in a way that authors don't need to do much more than they're already doing. All right, that's great. Um, let's just continue with David Lippmann. OK. Uh, hi, I'm David Lippmann. I teach math at Pierce College, Fort Steilacoom in Tacoma, Washington. I'm also uh, working right now with Lumen Learning, which is an open educational resource um, support company. Uh, I am, uh, textbook-wise, I, I, I've written two open math textbooks on math for liberal arts and pre-calculus. And uh, I'm also the uh, lead developer for iMathis, or my Open Math, which is an online homework system, which helps provide some of that um, supplementary ancillary material resources that um, you know can be a challenge with open textbooks. Great. Over to you, Kathy. That's not the right order, Peter. <laughs> Are you going around? <laughs> oh, it's on my. I guess it's it's on my oh, screen. Oh, it's a different it's order, order depending. I, that's interesting. I had expected it to be the same. Yeah, no, I'm on the very end, so I was just really waiting, relaxed. It's not going to be my turn for a while. Hi, I'm Kathy Fletcher, and um, I just recently finished a three-year fellowship with the Shuttleworth Foundation that was about creating tools and processes for creating and editing and sharing open textbooks. And in particular, we worked on an adaptation of the Aloha uh, in-browser HTML5 editor that would have semantic features so that you could create textbooks and be able to pull out um, exercises, pull out definitions, and things like that. And they would have semantic structure around them. And one of the other pieces in there is using MathJax to, uh, to do very simple mathematics editing, either using ASCII math as the code or LaTeX as the code. And then MathJax is doing a live preview and also um, the plugin for the editor uh, makes sure that the math is stored into the document using MathML with an annotation of the source format. And then you can you know, cut, cut and paste math in documents. You can move math around. Things like that become very easy inside the editor. And um, I've actually started a, a, a position back with Rice University that's looking more at learning. And so there's also a lot of relationships there with uh, creating open materials that then might be used uh, to, to be recommended to students when they're struggling on a particular s assessment, for instance. So my, my, new, my new work also has relationships to open textbooks. And I'm done. All right, great. Uh, then I'll pass it on to Kent. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Kent Morrison. I work at the American Institute of Mathematics. Uh, formerly, for 30 years, I taught math at Cal Poly. So I am um, now in a sort of a second career. But my main 
uh, work here is uh, to direct the AIM Open Textbook Initiative. We are uh, encouraging the use and uh, trying to help the improvement of open source and open access textbooks for undergraduate mathematics courses in the U.S. Pretty much standard curriculum. Um, we're not necessarily aiming to be pedagogically uh, innovative. We would uh, we, we look at our target audience though, the people we're trying to reach as math faculty who are uh, choosing textbooks for classroom adoption and we would really like to uh, see more classroom adoption of the open source, open access textbooks for, for a number of, of reasons. So as part of this initiative we have a five member board, editorial board, and we um, are evaluating textbooks and then making information in a succinct and brief form available uh, on the uh, on the web. That's it for my introduction. Great, thanks. Um, Phil, you're next. Sure. So I was trying to figure out how to unmute. Um, hello, I'm Philip Schatz, and I work or I'm a developer out at Connections um, at Rice University, and I worked on the math editor uh, that Kathy mentioned earlier. And in general, I do work, I guess, publishing the, the textbooks, making sure that the math in the books is um, readable and accessible for other devices. I'm yeah, interested in accessibility and uh, yeah, being able to, to edit math for the authors that might not all know lots of Thank All right. You. Thank you. And then finally, it's uh, Rob. Over to you. Thanks. Hi, I'm Rob Beezer. I teach mathematics at the University of Puget Sound, which is also in Tacoma, very close to David Lippman. Uh, about 10 years ago, I wrote uh, an open source linear algebra textbook. At the time, uh, PDF seemed to be the natural target. Through the years, I've been interested in web presentation, so the book has been through a couple of formats and will probably change source format again. Uh, MathJax, I think, really makes a lot of things possible. So to get the, the math looking good and easy to author and get a lot of different outputs uh, within HTML. So I see MathJax as a big game changer. Right now, I'm trying to design a XML, it would be called an XML application, so a set of tags that are very easy for an author to use to write a very structured document like a mathematics textbook, but still just enter the mathematics in the tech format that everybody knows and that is uh, pretty useful and powerful. So that's my current project, and uh, that's it for an introduction. Great. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, um, I, at this point, I want to. Rob, can you mute? I think. Ah, awesome. I think that was you. Um, I want to point out one technical detail to the um, uh, viewers that you can actually ask questions. There is a Q&A button uh, either on the event page, and there should be, if you're viewing uh, the Hangout, there should be a button somewhere named Q&A. Uh, might be small. Uh, but if you click it, you can ask a question, and uh, we will see this um, in the Hangout, and we can actually select questions and answer them. Um, so please go ahead. Well, I guess I just want to open the floor. I mean, we didn't want to do this in any form or fashion. Um, but just to throw in some of my thoughts is that when it comes to open textbooks, there, there seem to be essentially, well, it's three big uh, topics um, that come up. And that seems to be the, the initial, and we have representative of all three, so it's, it's really nice to, to have you all here. Um, but I, there seem to be three, which is, on the one hand, the, the authoring side, um, including the question of collaboration and collaborative editing of a textbook. Then the quality assessment, if you will, the actually deciding on a textbook that can could actually be used in practice, and then getting it to the audience, which means what kind of format to use to deliver them, how to actually reach the audience, and all that uh, jazz, I suppose. So I guess I, w I was uh, wondering if there's any side of it which you want to talk about specifically. Um, we have 
one of each, I suppose. So um, let me open the floor. Are there any obvious starters that you would like to, any interesting questions? I guess let me actually hand it over to Kathy, because as you might not know, in the last Hangout, uh, we had here you know, at MathJax, um, Kathy actually came up and asked lots of questions. So uh, this triggered me reaching out to Kathy and David Farmer to actually organize another Hangout specifically on textbooks. So maybe over to you, Kathy, and you might just have the perfect trigger for the conversation. So I'm obviously being punished for causing trouble in that prior Hangout. Um, you know, so in regards to authoring, one of the things that's that's a big issue and that or and that several people have talked about is, you know, what format are those open textbooks in? Um, David Farmer started with the idea that you know PDF is not a good enough format if you want to be able to to do interesting things with that on the web. And um, Connection started out with an XML format for their open textbooks, and then now has moved to an HTML format, but a very structured HTML format. And then Rob Beezer is inventing another XML format that. Um, is simpler than a LaTeX, the LaTeX structure that, that a lot of mathematicians use, uh, but will then use LaTeX for math because that's easier than any XML format for math currently is. Um, so I'm going to just throw out, you know, how, how important do the rest of you think agreeing on a particular format is with, with these kinds of things, or are we just trying to get to something where we can easily transform things between formats. And PDF certainly doesn't match, doesn't meet that criteria. But the other kinds of things that we're talking about, HTML and, and XML do. So I'm throwing it back as a question about format. Rob, do you want to, do you want to talk about what, what drove you to, to invent, to, you know, to create an XML format? Yeah. Right. Well, so I guess the, the one response to your question a minute ago is uh, a, a common format is good if you want to share material across projects or authors. And I, I get the feeling that a lot of people want to write a textbook that's sort of continuous, that has one voice. And I think in math it's really hard when you change notation or you have slightly different definitions that may be equivalent. I would find it very hard to, to sample from several textbooks and try and make one course out of several different authors' work that way. So I'm, I'm not as, uh, I don't think it's quite as important that necessarily everybody uses the same format. Uh, I'm, I'm really interested in, so part of the reason, the real reason for doing this XML application is I would like to see people that start writing something now capture the format, the structure of their document in a way that LaTeX doesn't. And, and I want to make it really easy for authors to do that. And then with starting from XML, you can make almost anything you want from that. So if there is some other standard that emerges, the kind of things that people have written in what I'm working on now will, should convert to that easily if it's designed right. So my main emphasis is trying to make something available now that people can start using that will capture their work in a structured way. I think there are two things that structure uh, provides. One is the ability to make it, you know, to take the same content and produce it for a lot of different for uh, a lot of different delivery mechanisms. So you want to deliver it on phone. Am I echoing uh, myself or maybe Rob to me? Maybe I'll, I'll mute while you're. It may be my fault ultimately, but everybody else has to mute when I'm talking. Um, so 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 one thing that any kind of structured format gives you is the ability to take the same source and produce it for multiple delivery formats for mobile and EPUB and online and print and have it look good in all those formats. So it gives you a way to hook the style of something to make the style of a book coherent. And then the other way that it's important or could be important and it's something that I'm very interested in um, is in being able to extract information from different textbooks 
So being able to extract all the definitions from, say, the courses you're taking. Maybe you want to do a practice widget that's going to quiz you on those definitions. Or being able to extract all the exercises and be able to do some sort of intelligent kind of practicing on that. And the reason, like, listening to what you were saying, Rob, made me think about that, that maybe those are two, we don't have to conflate those two. So it may be impossible to get people to agree on an overall structured format for things. Um, you know, their publishers out producing books and they're going to care about their styling and they're not, they're maybe not going to use a format that somebody else has come up with. And Rob, you had reasons that you wanted to structure your law tech in a way that you could easily convert it into your XML format and then, then to web. Um, but it might be that we could uh, agree on some of those smaller things once we have an application where it's like, hey, I've got this great learning tool and all I need is the ability to get all the definitions out of people's textbooks. That might be an easier problem to say. Let's be, because we've, we've done that with math. We basically said we want math to be easy to display on the web and so MathJax came to the rescue and said, look, put your math in as one of a few common formats. ASCII math, LaTeX, a couple of other things, and we'll be able to handle that. We'll be able to find the math in the document, we can pull it out, we can reuse it in different ways. So maybe we just need that for a couple of other things like definitions, exercises, theorems, things like that. Yeah. So, just... so, so one, of the, one of the big advantages of the XML is if you mark up definitions, if you mark up exercises, it's really easy to go through and get all those things out and in whatever format you like. So one of the first things I did probably about eight years ago with my linear algebra textbook in LaTeX, I had a student in class who came in before an exam with a whole pile of flashcards she had written. And it just sort of dawned on me that I put enough structure in my LaTeX that I could go through with a said script and rip out all the definitions and all the theorems and make a PDF full of flashcards. And I think that's part of what got me started. But that's that's really easy with XML. You can you can find those pieces and spit them out in whatever format you need them. So I have a comment about so Rob's XML. A thing I really like about it is authors could reasonably use it. So let's say you wanted to put a theorem or a definition. Okay. Well, you just do begin, okay, in LaTeX you do begin theorem, and then if the theorem had a title like fundamental theorem of algebra, in square brackets you'd put fundamental theorem of algebra, and then you put in the theorem, and then you'd say end theorem. And, um, well, that easily maps to Rob's XML because you just have a theorem opening tag, and then there's an optional title tag in that, or title argument to the theorem, and then there's a close theorem tag. And the same thing works for definition. So I think if we could better educate people who write in LaTeX that you just should, when you write a theorem, you should not have anything more than what I just wrote. If you like a little black diamond to appear at the end of the statement of the theorem, well then put that in the macro. I think we're actually very close to being able to let people share source even if the appearance is completely different. And things like LaTeX, as I just pronounced it out loud, and Rob's XML has about the minimal amount of tags you would need, and authors are willing to type that much, and um, it's easy to map back and forth between them, which I think we're close to being able to that, do that too. I think harder questions is, you know, if I'm writing a book on linear algebra, does my notation for adjoint, you know, occur over on this side or on this side? Um, that's the thing that stops people from sharing stuff. If you're typing anything extra than what I just said when you type your theorem, then you're just wasting your own effort and you should just have a decent macro that lets you just put in the minimal amount. The end. Something I might add is that the, the David is starting from what he calls structured LaTeX, and I've got this XML. We're writing out the same marked up HTML right now, so we're sharing that output. 
and have had a student working with the CSS and the JavaScript and all that kind of stuff. So we're both sort of hitting the same target as far as a, a common look and behavior of the end HTML product. But we should be able to map our sources back and forth between one another, at least logically, not character for character. Yeah, there, there are a couple yeah. of comments in the Q&A about, you know, separation of appearance and semantics. That's what we're talking about here. And um, Phil, like connections and the, the uh, editor that I was working on, do the same thing for an HTML, a structured HTML. Um, we took uh, DocBook's new HTML format for their thing and then uh, modified that to have class names or data dash types that, that describe the structure. And then you use styling for the semantics. There also seem to be some questions about collaborative editing that I'm seeing in the, the, the Q&A. Um, Right. Uh, maybe, but maybe we can stick with the semantics just a, a tiny bit longer. Um, I, I, I mean, I find this to be, you know, obviously for the exchange of information, that seems to be the crucial bit. And I wonder how people are thinking. You know, David um, Farmer's um, suggestion is basically an in, in extension, or uh, similarly, uh, Rob's idea is to educate the author. And that's not easy <laughs> on many layers. So I'm wondering, how do, you, how do you want to, you know, how can we approach this? Because it's not something that just, I think, applies to the markup. It also, as you know, I think was discussed on, um, on the Open Textbook blog, um, it also extends down to the actual mathematics, you know, using semantically meaningful macros uh, for the math mode. As well, and and this connects, of course, to the MathML HTML world, where you know you you might want to start thinking about content MathML rather than presentation MathML, where you have a similar level of abstraction over the uh, over the pure presentation. And so I'm wondering, how do you think we can, in the long term, overcome this you know this education barrier, which is also a conversion barrier, right? I mean, it also co connects to the uh, editor at uh, Connections or OER Pub. Um, that tries to create um, semantic HTML and you know have the semantic information in there. Do you think we can, we can actually make this work? So I have a suggestion for how <laughs> it might work, at least for some open textbook authors. If they went and looked at Rob's book, the online HTML version, and see how much better it is for them and their students to look at that than a PDF or any other HTML version out there, and then you tell them, well, all you need to do is write your LaTeX in this simple way, and then you'll have that. Well, then that's a good carrot that would induce some open textbook authors to go and start writing clean HTML. And once you get a critical mass of people doing that and being able to share, I think... Uh, so, David, do you, have a, do you have a website somewhere that has all the recommended markup? Okay, so if you go here... And and does it have so like a template file with some of the appearance stuff built into his macros and things like that, so people can just load something in rather than having to figure out how to do all that? Right. So um, so you can download the code I'm working on and try it out on whatever LaTeX you have, and it may actually work pretty well. Um, and I'm. As I go through actual examples, I'm slowly developing my ideas of how people should write things. And I guess I'm, I used to think people would have to be very rigid and be very restrictive, but the more I try actual examples, the more flexible I think it's possible to let people be. Um, so, I mean, do you have an open source, you know, LaTeX book I can run the code on and show you what it looks like? No, my book isn't in LaTeX because I don't know LaTeX that well. And that's part of my point is that there are a lot of people out there who don't know LaTeX very well, and particularly community college folks, K-12 folks. I mean, mm -hmm. they have a lot of contributions they can make to the world of open textbooks. But, And I can figure out the basics of LaTeX enough to insert equations and, you know, 
that sort of stuff, but I don't know how to do any of the macro stuff. I don't know how to do any of that. And so all of that would need to be set up for me in order for me to even consider trying to write in LaTeX. Well, maybe writing it in XML would be easier. I don't think so. I think writing it in the connections editor would probably be easier. (laughs) Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I think that, you know, for authors that are already using LaTeX, then some training and and education and examples, you know, learning by examples, is a really good way to have some really beautiful stuff out there for people to see, and then they can take a look at how that's created, and they can copy that. I think that's a really good way. But for authors who aren't even using LaTeX to create their content, and there are K-12 math educators um, that don't use LaTeX, and probably even you know community college faculty, probably some do and some don't. And so for all of those those potential authors, what we've tried to do is, um, sorry about my phone, which I didn't think to make quiet. Um, we have tried to make the authoring tool itself give uh, create that semantic structure for authors. And then the only way to get them to use an authoring tool that creates semantic structure is to make that actually easier to do than hand writing those things. And so, you know, if you just have to drag in a, a definition or an exercise, something with a fair amount of structure, and you get that almost for free, or you can cut and paste, you know, a, a chunk from somebody else's book and pop it into your into your content and have it look good, and then maybe you change the content, but you've got the structure there. I think that that's how we're going to get that level of author to be able to create that same structure. Is that we really, and then, then you know, the idea is if it's a, if it is a, a browser-based editor, you could embed that in lots of different systems. So David sort of took the words out of my mouth in response to Peter's original question. When you when you show somebody the kind of output they can get before you show them what the XML source looks like, which I've tried to keep relatively clean, they, they see the benefit of doing it that way. And if somebody knows LaTeX already, if they've had that kind of experience, I think it's it's very easy for them to figure that out. I think, uh, David, if you want to come see me sometime, I could show you how to do XML in about an hour, and you could get some good-looking stuff out. I teach my sophomores LaTeX. I've had a few students the last year actually using the XML stuff that I have. And I've got good students, but they figure it out. I, I think uh, high school teachers could probably author, given enough examples. Uh, so I, I, think, uh, I think it's doable. And there's, there's this moment where you get somebody started, and then they come back to you, and they say, well, I need a tag for bold. And you say, you're never getting a tag for bold. You don't get such a thing. What do you want to do? And they say, well, I've got a volume number and a citation. You say, OK, I'll make a tag for volume in your citation. And at some point, they kind of get it. They, they realize the, the difference. But it takes a, takes a while to wrap your head around it. But then they're, then they're off and running. So I think it's doable. I also wanted to comment that I was addressing the question of people who write bad LaTeX, how can you get them to write good LaTeX? I wasn't really talking about those who don't know LaTeX, how do you get them going? And I'm actually serious that, you know, Rob's XML, it's very understandable. You begin, like, you just have a section tag, and in that, then you have a paragraph tag, and then you have a theorem tag, and then a, you know, equation. It's really, it's just tags. And whether you say begin theorem or put the word theorem in angle brackets, it's kind of the same. So it's neither easier nor harder uh, either way uh, to do that. And yes, I agree, it would be good to put out like a blank book, you know, as an example, so you just fill it in um, and uh, with whatever content you want. So, um, well, this is told from Connections. Um, I would add that people, like we've used, historically we've had a custom XML format to sort of restrict the, the types of Content so that you can't put in things like bold tags. Uh, 
for over a decade. And while we do have you know, one or two percent of the people that uh, take the time to learn how to edit XML and our XML format, um, the vast majority of people that want to make small contributions or change a book by removing some chapters, for example, a teacher doesn't want to teach you know, an entire book or you know, charge students for a whole book, there's no way for them to, to contribute in that way. Um, also, I guess I'd add, making an XML editor is next to impossible. Um, there are a couple out there, commercial ones, but in terms of open textbooks, I don't see that as a, a practical solution. But anyway, just one data point. It's very interesting, um, if I may interject. I, I feel like if these two sides, you know, if you will, the, the WYSIWYG approach, which isn't really WYSIWYG in the, in the OER pub, um, situation, because it's, as Kathy described, it's, and, and Phil, it's very much focused on providing structure and making it easy to write structured content, even if it's in a WYSIWYG situation. Uh, and on the other hand, the XML versus clean LaTeX um, setup, I feel like if those two can work together, you're probably in the, you know, you're going in the best direction. Do you know what I mean? Uh, like, if you can use your clean LaTeX and your, you know, and, and Rob's XML and pull it into the editor, and on the other hand, the editor being able to produce output that you could pull back into a Tech format or an XML format like Rob's, then I feel that might just be exactly the point where the format might be balanced perfectly. So actually, um, I'm curious, is there a link um, to the, an example of the XML format, because I'd be interested in spending some time and seeing if I, you know, how difficult it would be to mark it up in HTML. So if uh, I've got a skeleton website up, it's mathbook.pugetsound.edu. And I think you'll find a link at the bottom to a, a sample article where I've just sort of thrown in everything that I've implemented as I implement it, and you can look at the source through the GitHub version. I think that's what the link points to. So you can get a feeling for what it what it looks like from that. But uh, you can you, you can grab the whole GitHub repository if you want to dig a little deeper. And I, I should add that I don't see what I'm doing, and, and perhaps David feels the same. I don't see this as necessarily two sides. I see it as somewhat complementary. Uh, there, there are authors and, and David and I have talked to some of them. There are authors who would never use a web interface to write a book. They would rather be in Emacs doing their thing. And there are people who are never going to write in Emacs and, and, and be able to handle authoring XML. So I think there's a place for, for both approaches. I've tried out a few of the XML editors, and I find them kind of heavyweight. Uh, just in the last couple of months, I've been using Sublime Text, which it's like $70 or something like that. And it just does a nice job of syntax highlighting. highlighting. It completes uh, tags. And I find, I find I am super productive. I've got two or three other projects I've been working on this year. And it's just, I sit down and write for four hours. Uh, I don't even get XML syntax anymore because it, I, I, it's easy for me to check that all my tags are balanced. And then when I run it through my tool, I get no LaTeX errors either. So I, I write for four hours, and I, I produce about four pages of PDF, and, and I just process it and put it up, and, I'm, and I go. And I know I've got, I'm a bit unusual, but I think people can be that productive. I like, I like Peter's oh. idea of being able to go back and forth between these formats. Um, you know, like something... Like what you're saying, Rob, Sublime, you could even do a plug-in for your XML format for it so that other people could, you know, it might have some, some other features. And there is something very efficient once you know um, a structured tagging language and just writing in that, that tagging language. Um, Phil and a lot of developers use Markdown, and so people have said, so this idea that we could 
build pathways between these. If we're all doing it in a way where we're separating structure and semant uh, se semantics and, and styling, then, and we, you know, we keep, we get some projects together where we're trans translating between the two, we could have this WYSIWYG editor that preserves structure and that can write out to different simple formats, you know, XML formats. Um, and I will say that the HTML that it writes out, although it's a very clean and structured HTML, I still wouldn't want to hand write that. XML is denser um, because the tag name is the meaning rather than having the tag name be span or div and then all the meaning is encoded in other parts of that. It's just, it, just, it is more tedious to write in. So you want the WYSIWYG um, if, if you're between that. I think there was just a, you were hanging there for a second, or was it just me? I don't know, it was hanging for me as well. Could you just repeat the last sentence, Kathy? Or are you hanging again now? Am I hanging? I, you guys are not hanging for me. You were hanging there just for a second for your last sentence, and I feel like we missed the closing. The most important, I, well, yeah, right. I don't know what my last sentence was, just about okay. that it would be great to get, you know, to have some projects where we get tools that go back and forth between the, the WYSIWYG right. and denser languages, denser XML languages. All right. Well, I'll consider the answer at least closed, and I wanted to, you know, take some time off and, and respond to a few questions or look at a question that we might tackle. Um, and there, as Kathy already said, earlier, there are a bunch of questions around how to organizing, how to organize collaboration. So um, let me pick one to be representative of the couple of questions. Let's take this one by Albert Schiller. We've kicked around the ideal of a community-developed textbook using a development model similar to open source software projects. Are there any textbooks, text projects out there that are close to this kind of development? model. And just to throw in a few others, you know, there was another question, how will the collaborative editing work? You know, will it be online? Will it be moderated? And, um, and then Svia Siegman asked uh, if anybody had some thoughts on uh, open annotation, and I suppose in that, in that context. Otherwise, she will correct me, I'm sure. So anyway, so some thoughts on how to organize the co collaboration. Any experience? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just throw out that, I mean, obviously one of the challenges that we face is a lot of us mathematicians think that books should have a cohesive voice. And so trying to get a true collaborative work can be challenging. Um, I mean, the, the, the success that I've had is, is, is twofold. One is, you know, one of my books is a topics book, and that works really well to do collaboratively. So there's been several topics that have been, you know, chapters of the book that have been contributed by other authors. And then I make some effort to try to make sure that the formatting and, and everything is consistent with the rest of the book. So it's helpful to have somebody who's sort of the maintainer or sort of the, the main editor who makes sure that it all sort of works together. But then I mean, one of the other great things in open textbooks is you know, anyone who's using it who has a suggestion or finds an error can say, hey, I have a suggestion or found an error and can contribute back, kind of like a pull request, if you will. And, and so maybe it's not a full-on collaborative editing, but it's certainly a collaborative improvement process. In terms of collaborative editing, I think that the best example of that is the Siavula stuff. So maybe Bill can talk about that since that's connections related. Yeah, sure. Um, and actually, I, I would defer to Kathy since she's actually done sprints with uh, math teachers in South Africa uh, that are combining multiple uh, textbooks together for their class. Holy pieces. Kathy? So I, I think, you know, still the key to see Vula's success in collaborative editing is having some smart people involved in, in getting people physically together, having a few smart people and technical people who, who just use tools, they are very, um, I'm trying to think of the right word, 
but they just use anything that's available and then they do a lot of conversions. So they've done a whole lot of collaborative editing using Google Docs and that is not perfect. There's a lot of stuff that goes wrong when you're trying to do that, but it's a fantastic collaboration setup. So then they will use tools to convert the Google Docs into their XML format or, or through the, the WYSIWYG editor that we have that has structure. Um, so, and they, 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 they have a lot of nice procedures. So when you, you know, a lot of people have put in the, the chat questions about cohesiveness and coherence of terminology. And so they do, you know, they'll create a document that's got all the terminology in it. They, they start out any kind of collaborative process by doing an outline of the content. And then they have people. That's the success of Cibula. And they are, they, we did a sprint with them using the editor with some teachers that got together and were looking at, you know, the way the editor does the structure. And they, they really got the, the idea of, of that, how powerful creating, doc, creating um, their textbook with all that structure would be. Um, and then one of the other keys, I think, to successful collaborations and uh, authoring is to have material that you're starting with. So you also, again, have a lot of samples that you can look at. Hey, this looked good. I want to do something just like that. I cut and paste it and, and edit from there. We've tried to uh, find all the available open source or open access uh, textbooks on the, on, on the web that are appropriate for full textbooks. Uh, for full course, and I don't think there's anything that's really a, a collaborative authoring uh, result or product. Um, I I really think that the collaborative improvement that uh, David Lipman mentioned is is what we should be aiming for now. Uh, when you're looking for a, a textbook for a course, they really are pretty much single authors. There might be a couple of authors in the same location, but a, a true over the internet open collaboration is, uh, is, is, is going to be hard to do. Um, but I really think that we can encourage authors, ask authors to, to be open to improvement and, and expect them to respond to um, suggestions or prompts from people who are using their, their textbooks. I can definitely throw in another example, which is on the you know on the far end of um, research oriented, um, and that's the um, homotopy type theory book. Uh, if you Google for H O T T, that usually gets you to the book. Uh, this is an open source um, textbook on really a new theory for the foundations of mathematics. It's a very theoretical uh, piece of work. It's nothing you want to read, but it's something that was developed entirely. Uh, openly and collaboratively, um, but again, I think you know there was a core group uh, at the Institute for Advanced Studies that um, that took care of the core, and you know they had a website, a blog, uh, events, ongoing events. You know they met at conferences and so forth. But that might be another good example if you want to look at um, a model on the that that this model can actually work on the research level. Um, All right, let me, unless there are more comments. I mean, I know that by now, I mean, I've seen about a gazillion uh, GitHub-focused book editing or book collaboration projects popping up all over the place. So these are naturally, um, for those who are inclined to work with Git and GitHub, they seem to be a natural tool, at least. Even though they are, you know, most of them are focused on um, well, not mathematical textbooks, but you know, programming and so forth. So those might be interesting as well. I don't know, um, you know, things like Bitbooks or Gitbook or you know, some some such combination of words that will usually get you there. All right, let me close that question. Unless there are any other comments. Someone in the uh, in the chat mentioned open annotation, and it I think it does relate to the collaborative editing and this idea that 
even if you start with a singly authored book, you're going to have comments, feedback, both from learners, from other faculty, from, you know, anybody. Um, and so there are some interesting tools out there for annotation. Um, we played around a little bit with one that you could, so, so with the, the book editor, the WYSIWYG editor that stores books on GitHub that we were working with, we also added in um, hypothesis annotation. We didn't really, you know, it was kind of more experimental at this point, but the idea is that you could see that, that and you could eventually incorporate changes that people have suggested into, into books. Maybe in a way, like the whole pull request kind of uh, software editing model works really well if you're already familiar with that, and I don't know that that's going to work for general uh, authors. Um, it's kind of an open question. But annotation, very interesting. I thought that was an interesting question that was in the chat. Well, let me, let me try to tease out a few more reactions. Um, because I think, you know, much like Kathy, I find open annotation and hypothesis in particular a uh, highly fascinating tool. Um, but I've, I'm also wondering where the right place for this is. You know, is it actually, is it in the authoring workflow or is it more in the reading workflow where you actually want your, you know, your readers to be able to annotate the text themselves but also feed that annotation back to you in case they spot an error, um, a typo, or actually want to contribute, want to provide feedback that this, you know, that, that voice we've been talking about earlier, it just ain't there, and you might want to know that. So I'm wondering how people see this. You know, wh where, um, where do you see better feedback coming into your projects? Do you see it? And this brings me back to my original question about the multiple parts uh, of open textbooks. Do you see this more during the production or more during the actual you know, um, consumption if that distinction or if that distinction is simply not valid anymore and it's all just one? Now I've said too much. No, I, well, I don't have an answer to your question, but a good online textbook has to have a way that you have your own personal copy you're looking at, and you can make notations. So, um, I mean, I downloaded some of the annotation things that are out there um, that lets you do this, but I never, none of them strike me as being aimed at a scholarly audience. Um, like, you annotate. Uh, I mean, I attach an annotation to a paragraph or a theorem. I, I don't want to highlight words and things like that. So if anybody knows of a good annotator, or uh, I definitely want to automatically put that into, like, my program that converts things. Um, but it, it has, and uh, even if it only works if you're on the same computer, or, you know, so that would be good enough. But uh, there's a real need for that, and there's... We're so far from making use of what the web can do for textbooks online, and that's just one of many things that uh, you know, isn't really there yet, in my opinion. So, um, actually, if I can add the annotation tools, I'd, it seems like the in order to be able to tag or annotate uh, an a theorem or a paragraph. Um, you would need to, to have like an ID uh, on that element so that you can refer to it in the URL. Um, and I, I do think there are tools, I think Hypothesis does, um, that type of uh, annotating on you know, elements, not just segments of text. But Yeah, um, so I guess having IDs on elements is very important. Um, it would also be important for things like transclusion, which I noticed in someone's book that has the, the pop-up formulas. But okay, so if Rob's 
XML, Rob's vision will assign unique identifiers to theorems and exercises and examples that persist across all versions. So you can actually annotate in a way that survives upgrading and coming out with the new version of the textbook. So I think that's sort of implicitly part of what we're doing is, um, again, breaking the, um, you know, fixing the problem that when a new edition of a textbook comes out, you've lost the old edition. Well, that doesn't have to be that way. And it's, there's no problem for Rob's transformation or what I'm doing to keep the identifier persistent when, as the book changes. So, which, so th definitely annotation shouldn't, that's not a problem for the annotation. Uh, the, the hypothesis project also does, they've got some algorithms to do matching of text so that as things version, not only if you have preserved IDs, so they will use IDs if they have them, but if you haven't preserved IDs or if you're trying to match, let's say, a portion of a paragraph, they are use, you know, trying to do algorithms that will Mat, will continue to match those annotations and not orphan them. And they're also looking at, you know, if somebody, if there, if there are multiple versions of, some, multiple distributions of something, not necessarily versions, like it's the same book, but there's one online, there's a PDF version that people download, and there's an EPUB version. Comments on that. Could you, could you actually bring all those comments together in some way such that everything that was commented about that so there are these technical issues. And then I think something that Peter was alluded to, and I, I definitely have no idea how to do it, but I think it's important, is how do you actually present all that? Like if I want to take personal notes, that's different than notes that maybe were taken during a class that I took and I over a time period versus somebody is actually a scholar in the field and has made a comment and that, that annotation is interesting no matter what time I come to that and how to filter all that stuff. And it's a very hard problem. It's a user interface and all kinds of kinds of interesting things. As the tools get good enough, I don't think they were really good enough for us to care, but it seems like we're of that being doable. So then we'll have to come up with filtering. I did want to add one thing to David uh, Farmer. You had asked, um, you know, well, you had described how you've been looking for projects that do annotation, and I think open annotation as a standard is certainly something that is highly focused on um, all uses, including academic. I, I mean, you know, the one of the editors is certainly somebody who's been um, now. If only I could remember his name, Robert Sanderson. Anyway, he, um, I can look that up <laughs> if need be. Uh, and uh, he, for example, has, you know, he was, I think, uh, until quite recently at Los Alamos, um, and he had used the annotations on scientific documents, uh, say, for example, from the Manhattan Project. Uh, they've been using those in, in practice to uh, transcribe and improve the um, digitalization. Um, of those documents, so that's certainly a model as a you know as a data model and a markup model that is designed to cover all bases, which at the same time of course makes it you know um, to a certain point cumbersome um, as XML tends to get, and so I think another challenge would be to see if you can you know if there's a way to simplify that you know much like the simplified tech and the simplified XML and the simplified HTML markup to actually be able to to reuse those components efficiently and convert them from one to the other. But that's obviously my pet peeve. So, all right. Yeah, definitely, some of the things I've looked at, I mean, it's for kids, you know, marking up photos and stuff like that. It's completely, and I'm pretty skeptical of anything that's aimed at all audiences. So, like, the thing I want to do is I want to convert math papers and books to good HTML. I do not want to have a general LaTeX, you know, to HTML converter. There's plenty of those. None of them give suitable output 
for what you expect for an online textbook. I think we need specialized tools that work wonderfully for scholarly math papers and math textbooks and maybe are totally useless for everything else and I'd be comfortable with that as the result of our efforts. R right. I mean, I guess, you know, the why I like to point out the, you know, the, the more full-fledged solutions like the open annotation framework is that, you know, the that the markup that we're you know we're using to produce content is not you know uh, is not a goal in itself, right? We want to produce something that people can then actually read. And so when you you know design when Rob has wrote his XML, he wrote it because he I'm assuming because he wanted to create uh, PDFs via Tech and HTML, um, you know, so people can read something in the browser. So I think it is worthwhile to keep in mind. What you're, what we are creating, and with what other, you know, backend structure or you know, delivery structure we are eventually creating output um, for. And so, you know, since open annotation is now a, you know, an official W3C standard, or at least on the way, it's a, at least an official working group. Um, that's something to just keep in mind when thinking about annotation. That's all I meant to say. But I agree that we need specialized tools. I just think we, they need to hook into what exists. All right. Any? Shall we tackle another question or any other? By the way, do we do we want to go over time? I kind of scheduled one hour, but I'd be happy to do a little longer if you guys are up for it. I see some nodding. Yay. All right. So, request for more questions. You you can take a you can suggest a question out of the uh, stream Peter because I don't want to ignore any of the things that people have asked that are watching. I have a question for David Lipman because he is both doing open textbook authoring himself and has a system for doing assessment and you know he's got to do mathematics editing in both of those um, and my question is David when you from with your open textbooks do you have all of your problems and examples and things from there into my open math or and what are your thoughts on on that kind of process uh it sort of depends, <laughs> uh, and and actually for for the pre-calculus book in particular, we actually started by going the other direction. We started with questions in my open math, and we copied them into the textbook, because heck, if we already have these algorithmic questions in the in 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 the my open math system, yeah, you know, why write questions when I can just hit generate? And so we just generated questions, copied them in. Uh, you know, generated two versions of each, each that gave us an odd and an even, and then uh, you know, once we had a bunch of generated questions, uh, you know, we went in and added in stuff that wasn't online appropriate questions. You know, so we supplemented with the stuff that is more open-ended, you know, stuff that you wouldn't put online anyway. Um, for the other, for the other book, my first book, I did a little bit of that, but but I've also gone done some of the other going the other way also. But I've, to be honest, I've done very little pulling directly out of texts, mainly because the goal of my open math, like web work, is, is algorithmic assessment. And so pulling a specific question out of a textbook doesn't do much good. Um, the thing that that would do good for is if you were trying to load into you know, some generic LMS or something like that. All right, let me um, jump in, give everybody some time to think, and just jump into uh, the questions a little bit. Um, so first, there was a link that I wanted to share. Uh, Michelle D'Souza linked to, this is just a bit of a resource, um, an open textbook on you know, teaching how to do open source projects. Not very, you know, it's not about 
math textbooks, obviously, but I think um, a worthwhile link to check out. Just some, you know, something nice from the uh, viewers. So that's great. Uh, if you ever, you know, want to think about open source more generally, that's worth your while. Um, another small thing is uh, Alberto Petarin. Um, he mentioned a project. I don't know how, who is aware of the Substance IO. Um, the Substance guys are um, is a small team in Austria. They've written an editor um, a while back, and recently they've um, they've done a project for one of the new um, life sciences open access journals called eLife, and they did a project called Lens. So if uh, anybody has ever stumbled upon that, it's a, a very nice demonstration of how to present uh, a scientific article, a scholarly article. Um, and that might be worth looking into because the substance model is actually, again, its own document format. Uh, in their case, I think it's a JSON structure, but you know, what's the difference? JSON, XML, you know. Um, so that's definitely something worth mentioning. So I thought I'd highlight Adato's question. And well, here's one that I really like, and I would really, or Phil, did I, did you want to say something? Oh, Phil has left us. All right. Um, he probably had to actually leave on the hour. All right, so let me choose one more question, uh, which I would love your thoughts on, uh, from Ply Sion. Sion. Uh, what can math undergrads do to help? Ooh, I got a couple ideas. Uh, <laughs> idea number one, of course, is is always giving feedback to the author if you find mistakes uh, or have suggestions for better ideas. Uh, another fun one that I've had some luck with is is um, solutions manuals because uh, that's something that a lot of open textbooks don't have is detailed solutions manuals. Uh, and so, and that's what what a great thing. I mean, even for a class who's using an open book to make that uh, homework assignment, you know, write up a detailed solution to one of these problems, and then collect them all. And now you've got a detailed solutions manual. I mean, what a great use. Well, and then you know, have an instructor check it, of course. But uh, you know, it, it, but it, to sort of have that be a way of of sort of crowdsourcing some of that stuff that doesn't need to be in a consistent voice. Um, Another option there would be suggesting questions to build a test bank uh, of additional questions that could be available as you know chapter reviews or even made available to an instructor as a pool of questions to pull from. Because one of the things that I run into, uh, particularly with Lumen, as we've been working with um, faculty around the country, is is most faculty are not like us. Most faculty do not want to create a bunch of content. In fact, a lot of them don't know how to do anything except, um, well, no, I'm overstating here. Um, there are some, <laughs> I will say, there are some who, who, who are used to just getting the publisher book with the publisher test bank, with the publisher PowerPoints, and all the other ancillaries that come along with it. And if those aren't there, they, don't, they, they can't teach out of the book. Uh, they don't know how to do that stuff themselves. And so the more that, of that sort of stuff that we can provide, um, the better. Uh, and and you know getting some help from other people for some of those tasks is is a great place to to do it. I think students can just as uh, singly or in groups just talk to faculty and let them know that there are open source and open access textbooks available. For certainly for most of the standard courses now uh, at the sophomore level and above, there is a viable textbook that is. Uh, is out there, and there are still a huge number of faculty who are not aware that those are possibilities. I think students maybe could agitate at the department level, maybe through a math club or, or just uh, just by talking to faculty to make that sort of an uh, unofficial policy to take a look at the uh, available resources before choosing a textbook. I'd like to follow up on something David said. It's good to have material out there, like here's a solution to this exercise, here's a video on this topic. But I mean, the whole point of what Kent has done 
is there's a huge number of things called open source textbooks out there, most of, most of which are not actually useful uh, for, you know, as a primary textbook for a course. Likewise, there's loads of demos and videos and supplementary material out there, most of which is maybe not as good as it could be. And um, I think we're, I'm, I don't see us heading towards finding a way to collect together what's good, know what's good. It would be great if we did that because if here's a good video on some topic in some linear algebra book, well, it can contain in it, you know, metadata saying this is appropriate for chapter so-and-so in Rob's book. Then the online version of Rob's book could automatically include a link to that, you know, if it was somehow known that this is good material that's worth, worth linking to. So I'm wondering if anybody has any great ideas how we can actually start figuring out what is good out there because it doesn't help to create yet more supplementary material if it's not actually, you know, what you want to use. Well, I mean, at some point it comes becomes the role of a teacher to vet materials and, and or you have to trust somebody else's vetting of materials. Um, I mean, that's, that's always the challenge, isn't it? Uh, I mean, that's the same reason that people have trouble with open textbooks is because they're not willing to put in the effort to vet them uh, the way that they don't bother to with a commercial book because they assume that they're already okay which is why it's good what Kent and, and you are doing uh, because it you know provides somebody else's vetting uh, to, so that teachers don't have to. Um, in terms of supplementary resources, I mean that's one of the things that we've been trying to do with my open math it, you know, mostly for the freshman level or even pre-college courses is, um, you know, for an open textbook, try to identify some good quality supplementary material in terms of videos and, and, and online exercises uh, that can align with it. Um, I mean, I think it'd be, uh, your idea of sort of including that in the book is, is a nice idea, but I don't think it necessarily has to be directly integrated with the book. I think there can be a second step or, you know, somewhere else that that happens. No, my, my point of integrating with the book is it happens automatically um, that the author doesn't need to do anything. It's the conversion to the HTML version or the online version of the book that lets that happen, provided the author has said, I trust my open math to be a source of supplementary material for this book. Then you automatically get you know, go to the table of contents, and next to each little section, there will be a link to a video or whatever. Um, uh, but there needs to be, you need authoritative sources out there uh, to make this happen. And then those sources need to have the data, the metadata needed to cause this link. So it's, it's not the author's problem, it's the supplementary source provider's problem, I think. Well, that's assuming that we can ever have a truly authoritative supplementary source provider, but that's a that's a different issue. <laughs> All right, um, I took the liberty of closing the the previous question, by the way, in case you noticed. Um, yeah, I think that's interesting. I you know there is I know that at least the hypothesis um, team is definitely thinking about these kind of connections that David Farmer just described. Um, because obviously that is one of the, um, you know, the obvious use cases that you use annotation to connect content like this. It sounds an awful lot, uh, or it reminded me an awful lot of uh, what you just said, David Farmer, um, like a distributive connections a little bit, you know, where you have simply the markup in your content that somehow magically connects the different pieces and allows you to generate richer content by pulling in from these other sources that are all over the place. I do think that you can envision this in, in smaller scales. Like, like David's idea, think that if you have an open textbook and you're using it and you think it's a good textbook and you also use my open math, saying I'd like all the highest, highly rated 
problems in my open math, if, the, if you could semantically connect them with pieces of the book, you might be able to do some of that in an automated way. I think some of the work that David Lippmann's group Lumen is doing, they're trying to do that. Like This is a course, so we do think that we said we think all the stuff we put in this course is good stuff. We didn't put anything that we just think is junk, but now which of those things did students actually use and which things did students who get a high score use and could you even do something a little bit better than that by you know presenting people with different options and and seeing how they do you know whether they actually master the concept in a short amount of time from this resource versus this resource I mean there may be some things on the horizon it might be a long time before you can just say the whole internet is your source and, and you'll magically get the best things for learning whatever, but among kind of coherent sets of content, you may be able to filter out the stuff that really is not helping anybody from the stuff that's really densely useful. I don't know if that's... Yeah. I need to run also, so are we close to wrapping? Yes, uh, I think, I don't know how everybody else is feeling. Um, I would have loved to just pick on that one last question, but um, in any case, there's still, still good stuff in the comments of the Q&A um, app. So uh, Tsvia shared some more links to EduPub, and Albert Schuller, just maybe a thought in the very end, you know, asked the question, is it overly simplistic to just write for the web? Which I think hooks right into this, this end of the conversation. Uh, where we're really talking about connecting up the web uh, regardless of um, of the input that created the HTML representation. But yes, I'm, I'd be happy to wrap up, so let's just wrap it up and uh, thank all of you. I thank all of you uh, for joining. Um, it was a great pleasure. And um, all the viewers for asking great questions. And I hope we can do this again sometime. Thanks, Peter. All right. Yeah, thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for organizing. My pleasure.